He's been called on to steer Italy out of the pandemic and a severe economic recession. Mario Draghi is expected to form a non-political government of experts. But will the former president of the European Central Bank get the support he needs? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Kim Vanell. Italy has been facing a political crisis since its coalition government collapsed last week. The nation is struggling with an economic recession that's been made worse by the global pandemic. President Sergio Mattarella has now stepped in to limit the damage by naming a new prime minister. He says he wants to avoid snap elections and has picked a former European Central Bank chief for the top job. Mario Draghi is expected to form a government of specialists to confront Italy's challenges. He's been credited for saving the euro during the continent's debt crisis in 2012. But Draghi has said he needs the backing of the majority of parties in parliament to implement his plans. In light of this crisis, the situation needs to be met with equal action. With this hope and dedication, I accept the call of the president to beat the pandemic, to vaccinate our population, to offer solutions to everyday problems of Italians and to relaunch the country are the challenges we face. Let's take a closer look at what led to Italy's political and economic crisis. On January 14th, former Prime Minister Matteo Renzi pulled his party's support for Giuseppe Conte's coalition government. Renzi is against his plan to spend $240 billion in EU funds and loans to help recover the economy. The move robbed Conte of his majority in Parliament and forced him to step down before the end of the month. He was given a week to revamp the coalition but failed. Italy's reported more coronavirus deaths than any other EU member, with its toll now approaching 90,000. And even before the pandemic struck, its economy was heading into recession. Its gross domestic product fell 8.8% last year, and nearly 450,000 jobs were lost. Well, it's time to bring in our guests. They're all joining us from Rome today. Flaminia Sacca is Professor of Political Sociology at Tusha University. Alberto Castelvecchi is Political Analyst and Professor of Communication at Luis Business School. And Eleonora Polly is a Political Scientist and Senior Fellow at the Institute for International Affairs. A very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us here on Inside Story. I'd like to begin with you, Framindi Asaka. What are the challenges uh, that Draghi faces in attempting to form a national unity government? Ah, good question. Uh, it is uh, Italy, of course, and it's very difficult to predict anything here uh, as far as politics is concerned. But uh, it is very difficult to say no to such a curriculum and such a figure that has uh, acquired many, you know, appreciations worldwide, not only in Italy. So I believe that for the time being, there is a will that goes um, amongst various parties to try not to make him fail. That doesn't mean that we'll have a he will have a strong support, but it means that, for example, Salvini's League will probably not object to his uh, government. That makes things a little bit easier for him at the time being. Things will could change this evening, of course. <laughs> Alberto Castelvecchio, what's your take? Do you think that Draghi will have the numbers? I would think that he, he will find the numbers in the end, because no one of the the parties who are now sitting in parliament wants really to go to elections at the moment. In the end, if he will not find the numbers, President Sergio Mattarella will be forced to call for snap elections. But this is what uh, everybody seems to be um, not eager to do. People seem to be, to, to be eager to avoid elections now. It will be a bumpy and choppy road ahead for Draghi because he's an excellent banker, he's an excellent politician also, he's a great negotiator. Do not underestimate his political clout and his tremendous network of relationships all over the world. But in any case, he's facing, you know, hard life politicians of Italy who are very, you know, sometimes they, behind, they behave like rascals. They put the, the arena on turmoil and then they wait for you for negotiation. It will be a war of nerves, but I think he will succeed in the end. Mr. Castelvecchi, before we move on, I just want to uh, pick up on a point you said. You said nobody wants to go to elections or people don't want to go to elections. Why is that? 
because by electoral reform, the number of seats in the parliament has been restricted by 40 percent. So many of the people who are now sitting in the parliament are very sure that they will never be reelected for a second mandate. This is why they try to protect as much as they can their post. Sorry for being so cynical and skeptical, but sometimes the personal interest seems to prevail seem to prevail on the uh, general interest. And then people don't want to go to elections because the COVID crisis has put the country in ter terrible constraints. And uh, going to elections now is risky under many respects, the economic crisis, the many people dying every day, the medical supplies coming to Italy, they need to be managed with continuity. An electoral campaign will disrupt and discontinue that mm -hmm. and would be very dangerous in the eyes of many, many commentators. Eleonora Polly, I'd like to bring you in. Talk me through what you think the reasons are why the president has chosen Draghi. Is it his economic experience? Is it about having someone with a high profile or, or is it perhaps both of those things? I think it's both, and I think it was an excellent choice in the sense that, on the one hand, uh, Mario Draghi has the sort of leadership to govern Italy out of this of this crisis, and on the other hand, is a respected uh, member of what is called the European establishment, so um, he will enjoy the trust of other European governments and institutions. Draghi, well, however, will have to face a paradox because he, the man that saved the Eurozone, that did whatever it takes it to, 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 it took, you know, to save the Eurozone, will have to be confronted with what are the populist forces within, you know, the Italian political platform, which is on the one hand the Five Star Movement and on the other uh, the League. Mm -hmm. So he will have to, to 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 find compromises with these forces in order to have the political uh, support. To, to govern Italy. Mm -hmm. Just picking up on that point, uh, Flaminia Sacca, how have politicians so far responded to the idea of a technocratic government? And, and why exactly is it that the sort of more right-wing populist parties are not so interested in that idea? Um, they, they, I'm not so sure that they are not so interested in that idea. What's happening now is that the Five Star Movement, uh, who has large numbers in the parliament at the moment has f at first said that he will not back up a technical government. Of course, they were trying to keep Conte, former Premier Conte, um, in his job. Uh, that didn't work. Uh, so the, their position has started to change a little bit. But at the beginning, they said no technical government. We back up Conte. Uh, we're not going to vote for uh, Draghi. Um, and that was just yesterday. Uh, today, they started opening up a little. They started to say, uh, OK, um, maybe we could in the end vote for Draghi, but it has to be a political government. Um, League, uh, I think, is playing a, an intelligent role for once. <laughs> they see that the situation has become difficult from the former coalition point of view, uh, because the Five Star Movement is not so certain they want to back up this new government. So they said, OK, we're not going to object to a new government. So we will not say no. Um, of course, Draghi is has such a high profile, we cannot say no uh, per se. Let's see what he has to offer, what he proposes, and um, we might even not vote against it. OK. Um, I'd like to come back to you, Alberto Castelvecchi. What can Mr Draghi learn from past technocratic prime ministers? This is not the first time that Italy has seen a technocratic leader. Well, I think that Mr. Draghi has all the psychological and technical tools not to repeat some mistakes which have already been done by so-called technical prime ministers. He's compassionate, so he will try to ensure social security and to uh, keep unemployment uh, rates not growing too much because the the as you mentioned as you mentioned before we have a dramatic surge in unemployment and jobs lost so he will be trying to uh, somehow give some subsidy to the unemployed but at the same time, he will try to be negotiating more with the political parties. He's an excellent negotiator, I repeat. During his years at the ECB, he's been negotiating with prime ministers, with presidents of the central banks. I remember his epic 
clashes with Jens Weidmann, who was at the time the president of the Bundesbank, the German Central Bank. So he's quite he's quite good in negotiation, and he will not repeat the mistake of uh, you know seeming or looking too cold, too technical, too upright. He will be trying to get down into the arena and try to make his way, which is indeed very difficult, but it's not impossible given the extremely high-profile personality he's got. Mm -hmm. From Inia Saka, some are reading this as a triumph for uh, Matteo Renzi, who was able to bring down the governing coalition, unseat uh, Giuseppe Conte. Do you agree? He's, that's one of his main talents. He's very good at destroying coalitions. <laughs> and that's, of course, his success today that we are witnessing. Um, it depends on how it's, it ends, though, because if they manage to uh, form a, a government that is not too uh, inclined to follow um, former opposition's positions, like uh, you know, Matteo uh, Salvini's league, for example, then I think he will, he, we can call it a success. If they will have to find a, a great compromise with the right wing and the populist parties, then I'm not so sure that this will be counted as a success from former Democratic Party leaders, Matteo Renzi. Alberto Castelvecchia, I think everyone is agree in agreement uh, that Draghi has a great CV. He's got the background, but he is an economist, right? How equipped do you think he is to deal with the health crisis facing Italy right now? At last count, more than 88,000 deaths from the coronavirus pandemic. Is he equipped to deal with that? Well, he will be uh, able to choose uh, the infrastructural investments that the medical system needs. Under this respect, he's perfectly able to understand that we need more capability, more infrastructure, more beds for the people who are ill, for the elders, and he's able to be an excellent programmer of the economy. On the other hand, he will have to pick very carefully the uh, health experts for the Ministry of Health, which is indeed run quite well in this moment. One hypothesis we heard in the last hours is that he could maybe confirm some people on the staff there at the ministry and also in the Superior Institute of Health, which is the ISS, which is conducting very, very serious actions uh, concerning the crisis. But he will, have, he will be able to ensure economic and infrastructural support, which is badly needed in Italy for our medical infrastructure. So I'm not so pessimistic. I think he can do that mm -hmm. with the proper support by high technical figures. Eleanor uh, Polly, uh, it seems that Italy has a long-term issue with political stability. Uh, I guess you could call it a high political turnover. Why is that? I think the problem has been the, uh, the use of populist rhetorics, which has been done by traditional and non-traditional parties in the last years. So during electoral campaigns, political leaders tend to promise a lot, and then they're not able to deliver. That's why we have also this high turnout of governments. And there is also a lot of political gaming within the parliament. And this is also related to the, 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 the rise of Euroscepticism in Italy or anti-European feelings, in the sense that the European Union has been used in the past year as a scapegoat for all the political failures that, you know, governments of the time will not be able to, to overcome. Uh, this is, I think, the main reason behind behind this uh, the situation. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I think that what Draghi will have to face is not a pure technocrat government at this point, but we'll have to insert, I think, some political element in order to be able to have the majority of parties and govern the country out of this crisis, which is not just a sanitarian crisis, but is it's a social and economic crisis, first of all. Mm -hmm. From Ilya Saka, I want to get your take on that. Do you agree uh, with Eleonora's take on, on why there's been such political instability in Italy? The idea of it, you know, the, the popular sentiments having an impact on that? The popular sentiment has an impact, of course, but this is a long tradition in Italy. We cannot just, you know, think of the recent years. I think the tradition in Italy has uh, been based on a different uh, electoral system that has uh, granted in our political culture the idea that even a smaller 
and various more very you know minoritarian groups need to be represented in parliament and uh, that has uh, you know formed a fractured political culture that still lives on even if the electoral laws have changed and uh, i think we suffer from that of course populist leaders in recent years have you know had a big weight in the political life of this country. Um, the idea, also promoting the idea that if the government is, um, you know, uh, elected and is uh, in all its rights to govern, if the uh, polls say something different because the political, you know, sentiment has changed throughout the country, then they promote the idea that we need to go to uh, another election or to form a different government. And um, I think this is the most recent trend, but I think it comes from far away from a different political culture based on a different electoral law and system. Mm -hmm. Alberto Castelvecchi, <laughs> Mr Draghi's uh, technical predecessors, I read, on average lasted one year and four months. Do you think Mr Draghi will do better? How do you see this playing out longer term? Well, I think that Mr. Draghi's intention is not to last more than that, because I think it will be enough to restore Italy's path towards prosperity if he's able to do the right investments and to manage the right processes. And also because in a very few months from now, less than two years, we will have the elections for the president of the Italian Republic, where Mario Draghi definitely seems to be the, more cre the most credible candidate. So the ideal thing for many, many observers and for many, many of Draghi's supporters would be to have Draghi for a couple of years in office as prime minister and then to vote him as a, uh, let's say, the guardian of the Italian constitutional process as the new president of the Italian Republic, which would ensure him seven more years in office and a good and a good position to where look at politics from you know a higher position. Mm -hmm. So I think to be there not for just for two years is the ideal time lapse to ensure that he's uh, firmly in office, and then we will see. Eleonora Polle, uh, Draghi, when he when he gave a speech uh, after this announcement from the president, said he hopes for unity from political forces, but also from society at large. How do everyday Italians feel about all of this political upheaval? Well, the, the, the situation is that, of course, Italians are quite worried about the current recession and the health and sanitary crisis. And they look at this unexpected political crisis quite suspiciously in the sense that no one was expecting this government to fall, especially because former Prime Minister Conte, Conte was having a huge, enjoying huge legitimacy. Like, if you consider that in March last year, he had around 70% of the legitimacy and popular support, which has been decreasing, but still quite high. So, of course, on the one hand, Italians want a, 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 a strong political figure with expertise able to leave Italy out of the crisis, um, both crises, I would say. But on the other, um, there is also a part of the, of the society which is asking for elections because they believe that already the previous government was not elected because it was formed under a, 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 a new coalition within the parliament. And so there is also this huge part of citizens which are asking for a new government, which inevitably will be a, a right-wing government led by Lega Nord if they're going to have election tomorrow, I would say. Mm -hmm. Alberto Castelvecchi, Italy has a lot of debt uh, and has had chronic low growth. Why has its productivity been so sluggish for so long? Well, because uh, many, many politicians of the previous generations have chosen social consensus over social competition because they, they have not been, well, most of all because the uh, state expenses have been concentrated on subsidies more than investments. You know that if you, if you invest in building roads, infrastructure, technology, schools, harbors, and, and whatever makes a, a modern country make a jump into the future, you will have a return in terms of employment, prosperity, incomes. If you just invent in subsidies, it's subsidies and subsidies, you lose money, you uh, rise public debt, maybe you keep people calm because you just keep on, you know, printing currency, printing cash. But in the end, now we have, with the COVID crisis addiction, we have uh, 
was something like 170, 172% of public debt, which is almost unbearable. This is why we think that Mario Draghi's program of sound investment, not just subsidy, could be uh, uh, somehow the only way to invert this to invert this trend and to recover some prosperity for the future. From Inia Saka, the last technocrat, Mario Monte, helped improve Italy's ranking on the bond market, but then there were austerity measures. Do you think those maybe coloured Italians' perceptions or feelings towards another technocratic government or technocratic leader? And, and has that been a factor in the rise of populism? That is a problem. Some people have started to say, we don't need another Monti. Uh, uh, and of course, they think that Mario Draghi could be uh, a technical uh, manager for this country that will cut uh, fundings. But on the other hand, I think that um, uh, Castelvecchi was right to say that uh, we should not underestimate his political abilities and also his empathy and compassion. I think he has a you know, very clearly the idea that he has to manage the social problems and the political problems as well as the economic ones. Uh, and uh, that's something that he has already made clear yesterday in his first speech to, you know, to the country, to the nation. And I think that also the newspapers are starting to depict him in that way, not only as a dry, uh, technical, economic manager, but also as a person that has clear the problems ahead of us, he can see them clearly. So maybe that, that risk is going to be reduced pretty soon. Eleonora Polli, how did Italy get to this point? To the uh, economic or political situation? Political, politically speaking. Politically. Well, I think the issue was related to the rise, uh, as I said before, the rise of populism is not related to the last year. It's not just related to the rise of the Five Star Movement or, or Lega. It is a traditional use of populist rhetoric by even traditional parties. I would start from Berlusconi and going on. So, you know, promising more than what can be achieved and try to use populist propaganda to achieve more consensus. That is why we are finding ourselves in a constant situation of instability and political gambling, which is, you know, quite dangerous, especially uh, at the current situation with a lot is at stake, considering that the funding and the grants we're going to receive from the European Union are equiparable to the to the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. uh, of course, of the board. So I think um, there is there has been a lack of sense of responsibility from some minority parties. Um, I believe, you know, the current, the previous government was operating in this past, considering, you know, um, some internal issues. Uh, uh, but at this point, I think that Mario Draghi would be the best op option for the future of the countries, con considering that having elections would be quite risky because of the pandemic and because we have to be able to, um, to, to, to present a recovery plan by the end of April. Uh, Alberto Castelvecchi, something we haven't touched on is how all of these developments are going to, are likely to be viewed by the European Union. What do you think the EU is seeing when it looks at Italy now? Well, the European Union now, of course, is worrying about the timing because time is uh, running out. Uh, I think we should be ready for April, maximum May, to present a credible plan of investments for the recovery plan and many other subsidies which are, you know, uh, going to pub be powered into, into the Italian system. And I think that Mario Draghi's figure, if he succeeds forming a government, will be a guarantee for all the European Union leaders that somebody is managing the process well. Otherwise, the turmoil could become a very dangerous, a very dangerous land and it will make the situation of Italy bad because the uh, public debt and the other bad indicators would make it Italy's position into the e European Union unsustainable. So uh, I think that M Mario Draghi's figure is a is, is a sort of a, of a guardian figure that they see as a guardian angel of our economy. And they are looking at this experiment with a lot of attention and a lot of consideration. Just very quickly uh, for you, Flaminia Saka, political parties want to be in government. What do you think the leadership is going to end up looking like? Political, technocrats or both? I think it will have to be somewhat political. 
mm-hmm. uh, it cannot be just technical because this government needs the votes of the political parties that are sitting in parliament. And they made it clear that they want some political you know, accountability on the decisions mm-hmm. to be taken. Mm-hmm. So that's my answer. That's your take. It's all going to become clear in the coming days and weeks. Thank you very much to all of our guests, Framini Asaka, Alberto Castelvecchi and Eleonora Poli. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Kim Vanell, and from the entire team here in Doha. Bye-bye for now.